So my name is Bela Thron. I'm a new PhD student here at the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry. And I will cover one of the very basic uh, topics here in the summer school, namely the output tables. So um, I will keep this as simple as possible, but uh, also like uh, as informative as possible, because uh, this is the first time we do this online and for free. Uh, so there should be many beginners here in this uh, course and the output tables are really important. So I want that everyone can follow uh, what I'm saying. So hopefully um, this will work through this. Um, so now what actually are output tables? Um, so the uh, workflow we have for our two software uh, su uh, suites are um, that First, you have three micro experiments, of course, and this somehow produces raw data. And uh, so this is the output of your mass spectrometer. And then Max Quant takes care of all this data and um, actually makes some, uh, uh, generates some meaning out of it. And we covered this in the pre course uh, and uh, also yesterday, so the second half uh, yesterday. And what Max Quant then gives you are some output tables, which are really easy to read um, because they come in a, a tab separated format. Um, and they include all the interesting information for you to actually make science. So then uh, on this kind of data, you can do all your statistical analysis and whatnot. Um, and so you can then process these tables either with your own software if you want. So you can, I don't know, write Python scripts or MATLAB or whatever you like. But of course, we suggest um, that you use our nice Paseo software to analyze these output tables. Uh, and hopefully then, of course, one day this will lead to a nice publication and a um, really nice contribution to science. But also what you can do with these output tables is not only analyze them uh, in a statistical way or bioinformatics, mm, but also you can use them to optimize your method and to do some quality control and so on. So the researchers probably go this path here and like the people owning the machines, running the machines and so on, they probably stay here at the output level, uh, output table level and do some quality control. And to do this and uh, how we can do this, what example questions we could, uh, we could uh, ask here, for example, uh, we will cover now in this talk. So, um, the most important uh, part first, namely where can I find my output tables? So in your um, data uh, folder where, where uh, you run MaxQuant and so on, uh, there's this combined folder and there's something called txt because we name all these uh, output tables .txt because they are in tab separated format and then this is super easy so everything can read it. And um, you can even open it with notepad or whatever, um, but also Excel or any uh, other program you like. Um, and there are all your different output tables. So it's, it's a lot and we will cover now what they actually mean. And the most important part here is uh, already highlighted, but I will highlight it in, uh, even a bit more, namely in red. Um, this is this PDF here, because there there is, it, it's called tables, but it's actually something like a help because it helps you understand what all the columns or uh, the names of the columns actually mean in all the output tables. So um, if you're not sure what something means, you can look it up here in this PDF. And yeah, then it basically looks like this. So it's a summary of uh, all the columns there are. And it's pretty long, as you can see here, uh, because the tables are pretty long. And there's a lot of data to discover. So this uh, is an example. You can op open an output table with Excel. Um, and whatever other um, program you, you like. But of course, we suggest that you use Paseos. Um, and this we will cover in full detail on Thursday. So um, there we will have sessions, lectures, and so on, um, how to do stuff um, uh, in Paseos. So you basically upload, um, upload a matrix or one of the output tables, which is basically a matrix into Paseos, and then you can um, do stuff here. And also uh, in MaxQuant itself, there's something called the visualization tab. And there you can uh, sometimes so you can visualize your data and you can see here um, all your output tables. 
And now here in very small is um, already something that is very important, namely that there are four different lay, uh, levels which we sort our output tables into. Now I will enlarge this region here a bit, namely it's here four different um, kind of classes of output tables we have. And this I name the structure behind the tables because uh, when you understand these four different levels um, of tables, what, what they actually are, you're very good at understanding um, the tables them themselves. And also um, it's very important um, that you know which tables you actually want to look at if you want to answer one specific question. So now let's uh, go into this. So first you have the scan level and there we have three different um, output tables, namely for every scan that you can do. So um, you can first do the, like, the first MS scan, then you can second, do the second MS scan and you can do the third MS scan. Uh, and for every scan, there is information about the full scan available in these tables. Uh, this is mostly interesting for people who want to do quality control. Then we have the identifications class, and there are many tables, so here are uh, six in total. And this is the part which is most uh, important for the people who want to do actually research and for the, for the biologists here. So um, there you get your protein groups, so which proteins you think or which protein groups you think uh, are in your data or maximum discovered. Then the peptides, so um, the peptides which this discovery of proteins um, or this identification of proteins is based on. Um, some of them might be modificated. Um, then you have some information about uh, modification size. So here it's like oxidation, for example. Um, then some more specific information about the second MS scan and then um, information about the evidence, meaning that uh, evidence for you tells you, okay, which uh, peaks in the data actually caused the identification of a peptide, which then again caused me to assume that this or that protein might be in my data. Um, yes, so this is the part which is most interesting for biologists, um, not meaning that everything else is not interesting. Um, so then we have the features where you basically can see all features, so all the, also the features which are not identified. So here in uh, evidence, you see all the features that were identified and actually contributed to um, finding something. And here you can see information about everything that we have uh, in our data set or in uh, all the features which we identified in the raw data. And then uh, more specific about the match features. So this might be, for example, interesting to see, okay, um, how much, how many of my features did I actually identify as something interesting? And then finally, uh, we have three um, tables uh, giving you metadata, so information about uh, like what machines you were running, uh, what parameters you used, and so on and so. On. Uh, yeah, so my, for example, this is useful when you want to reproduce uh, a study or whatever. And now, basically, we're going to do one class after another and see what uh, information is in there. And we will start with the identifications. So the stuff that is um, interest or that is the most interesting for all the people actually doing um, biological research. Um, and we start with the table called protein groups, um, which is called proteingroups.txt, and there you have all the protein groups which are identified. So typically, uh, if you're really lucky, then you identify them one protein matching to uh, some peptides, but typically it's several proteins that might have given rise to the peptides you saw in the data set. So this is then called a protein group. And for this protein group, um, you, want, you want to know many uh, interesting information. So for example, um, which peptides gave rise to um, identifying this protein or um, this protein group. So um, this is done by referencing to another table, namely the peptides table. So every peptide has a unique identifier in a table and every protein also has a unique identifier in a table. And every protein then just um, in, in the table here, um, references to which peptides in the other table gave rise to the identification of this or that protein group. And then you also get information about like 
how many peptides did I find matching to this protein group? How was it found? Like, was it found by the second MS spectrum or was it found by match between bonds? Um, how good did I cover the um, sequence of the protein? So did I find only something at the N terminus or at the C terminus? Or uh, did I find uh, peptides all over the protein? Um, then did some things differ between experiments and so on? Uh, of course, you can find the, the values and the scores of your identification and so on. So this is the identification part. And then if you uh, want to do some kind of quantification in, in your study, um, so you can then, of course, get the ratios of light to heavy change. If you do SILAC, for example, you can get the uh, intensity information. You can get the uh, LFQ intensity. And so, so all this is um, in this table. And all this information is basically one column in this table. Um, now, uh, it looks like this. And I hope now that uh, this is there. So hopefully my colleague can show me. You have an example, right? Yes, I have an example. So hopefully my colleague allows me to open my example, which is there. Great. Thank you very much. A very big applause for Paley. So here, um, of course, this, this yellow part here would usually not be there. Um, I just uh, like colored some parts which I find now at the moment most interesting. And um, so this is the protein groups table. And I also included uh, two other tables here in this um, example. So this is the protein groups table. Then I have a peptides table and I have a, a modification sites. Table. But first, uh, let's have a look at the protein groups table. So it's relatively simple. And uh, we start at the left side. So here we first have the protein IDs of our protein group. So as you can see, there might be many um, proteins in one protein group. Um, but sometimes it's also uh, only few. And then you can see which proteins are the majority of that and so on. Um, so, and, and these are sorted. Um, how are they sorted? They are basically sorted by um, which protein might it be um, most likely. So the most likely one is uh, at the beginning. So uh, corresponding to that is also the peptide counts. So um, I found four peptides of all the peptides um, I found here. Uh, matching to the first protein, uh, which is this one here, and the second protein is this one, and so on. But only one of the peptides in this group uh, belong to the last one. So probably the last one is not the protein matching to this peptide. Um, exactly. Mm, then you have the number of proteins in total, the number of peptides uh, in total. And I think my lab, and now it's working again. So, um, you get the total number of proteins and the number of peptides. Um, and this is actually the data set which we will use in, on Thursday. So this is a SILAC experiment, which was done with uh, three different cell types and with three uh, repetitions. So like um, we did the same experiment uh, three times. So this you can see here. So we have in total one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Um, so we have three um, cell types, which here always have the same name. So HCC1143 is one cell type, so we have three of them here, and then three of the next cell type here, and so on. And uh, we have three repetitions of the same experiment, so this is stable by one, two, and three. Um, and for them, then, this here then indicates us, okay, in which experiment and in which cell type did we find which peptide? So this is here. And there's also information about um, how many unique peptides have we and how many, how many have we if we uh, count together the unique and the razor peptides. So razor peptides are some uh, peptides that are found in multiple of the uh, proteins belonging to this group, while unique peptides are the ones only found in single proteins of this uh, protein group. So um, it, as this is a sum, this here is always like equal or larger than the unique peptide count. Okay, so this was the first uh, information, and I found a lot more. And I think what is most interesting at the moment, of course, you can 
it's mostly uh, pretty self-explanatory, like weight, for example, I think everyone understands what it is. Um, then interesting might be like the sequence length of the protein, which you uh, uh, think most likely it is. So the first one in the list and here is the sequence length of all the proteins. So um, as you see, the order of the um, sequence length of the proteins of the protein group is always the same. So it's the same as uh, at the beginning, the IDEs of the proteins. Um, then you can get, of course, the score of the identification, the Q value. value. And then, and that's really interesting, um, you get in, uh, information about how um, something was identified. Um, and this should most of the time be by the second MS. And sometimes it's also by matching between runs. So um, here we have these two options, like by MSMS or by matching between runs, which is abbreviated as by matching. Um, and now we can see here that's uh, actually a SILAG experiment. Um, <laughs> because um, here you see a ratio of heavy to light. Um, I just want to mention that, so we will um, dig in more detail into this on Thursday. Um, so you have uh, the ratios for multiple experiment for the multiple cell types and the multiple experiments and so on. So here we can see that's a SILAC experiment. Um, and then here you can see the intensity um, of the protein group you identified. Um, and then on like uh, each uh, scan level, again, the intensity. Mm, and then finally, because I mentioned it in detail, was that here, every peptide group has a unique ID in this table, so which identifies it here, and which is referred to um, from other tables. So for example, from the peptide table, uh, for every peptide there, there's information about which protein group uh, it kind of belongs to. So this is then the ID which is referenced. And then the same, uh, but the other way around is done here. So here you have then the peptide IDs of the peptides which belong to uh, this protein group. As we uh, saw earlier, we had four peptides. So here we have four IDs, and these are the ideas found, uh, IDs then found here in this peptides table. Um, then you have some more detailed uh, information here, of course. So um, have the IDs for other uh, tables like the evidence table, MN, MN, second MS table, and so on. And so these are basically all identifiers in other tables. So this is the protein groups table, and this provides a lot of information. So as we have this open here now, I will just uh, quickly also go to the other ta uh, example tables and Again, some of them um, will be covered on Thursday, at least this one. here. So um, this is, for example, a peptide table. So there, um, as peptides don't have unique IDs, um, we uh, have the sequence as first entry for them. So what here actually is the sequence, which we assume it is. Um, and then you can see the N-terminals of the C-terminal uh, cleavage, and sometimes um, the N-terminal sewage is empty, like here, for example, because uh, uh, obviously you began uh, at the N-terminal. So this is the very N-terminal there. And then there's some interesting information because you can see here, um, like which was the last amino acid before um, the sequence and which is the last amino acid. So here, okay. So um, you can use this information to see whether your enzyme actually works correctly or uh, whether you have like missing. So this should of course only be K and R and nothing else. And if there's uh, any, something else, then it was a misclick. So this might be very interesting uh, if you want to test the efficiency or the accuracy actually more of your um, enzyme. Then you, you can count all the amino acids which uh, occur in your um, peptide and so on. You can have the mass, and there is the protein, so that the protein identifier, not in the table, but the um, protein ID of, I think it's Uniprot, um, and the protein ID, which is referred to as, again, at the end of the table, because all the in-between table references are at the end. Then here we have the start position of the peptide, and we have the end position of the peptide, so we can see from where to where did it cover the sequence. So this might, for example, be interesting if you want to find out. Um, so if if we, if, we, if we find out, okay, we take all the peptides belonging to one protein or one protein group, um, 
and then we plot all the start positions and end positions. I will show you how to do that all, um, how that looks like later to see, okay, did we cover the full protein or not? Um, so this is really interesting. Then of course the charges which you have that might be multiple charges. And then again, how it was identified. So um, most by second MS, but some by matching between runs. Um, and then here's the unique ID of the peptide. Uh, here's the ID of the protein group it belongs to. Um, and then again, other IDs of other tables. So it's basically the same as uh, the protein groups peptide. So the, at least the organization and the structure is the same. And then finally, the um, modification um, table. So I think now you should more or less have an idea about the structure of these tables. So um, first here, we have again the protein groups because we do uh, modifications on protein groups. So these are the um, proteins which, which we're interested in now, uh, which we're looking at now, which we identified. Um, and then here are the positions where we think uh, there might be some kind of uh, modification. Um, and this is now interesting because this is the informa information about how likely is it that we found the correct localization of the modification. So if this is one, then we can pre be pretty sure, okay, probably it's exactly the one amino acid that is modified, which we assume it is. But I mean, um, if it's 0 0.5, you can't be super sure. And, and then sometimes it can be even less. I mean, yeah, 0 0.4, it can be 0 0.1, 0 0.4. Whatever. Um, so here you can filter which ones you actually want to work with and which one you don't. Um, sorry, I have to wait until the laptop works again. So um, then there's a lot of information in this table, obviously, but I only want to go into one more because this here is actually where we think um, with which probability we think and um, where the modification is. So where we say, okay, here maybe it's here with probability 0.454, or it might be here with probability uh, 0.546. So obviously uh, it's more or less 50-50, so we can't be really sure. Um, but here, for example, as we are looking at uh, phosphor phosphorylation in, in this table, uh, uh, for example, um, it can only be here, so then the probability is one. Um, so this is interesting for you if you want to find out where actually um, the modification might have occurred. And then again, of course, in the end, there are the references to other tables. Uh, yes, to other tables. So the structure is always more or less the same. So now let's continue with um, the slides, so we saw that, how such a table looks. And we saw that the PTM sites.txt um, tells us interesting stuff about the modifications, uh, which we might find. Um, and yeah, we, uh, we saw all that. So now we, we remember the beginning and we say, okay, mostly the, these two um, tables are the ones which you want to um, then more uh, look into in PSEO, so the protein groups and the PTM sites, and maybe even the peptides. But yeah, typically, at least these two tables um, are analyzed in PSEO. And now, if we want to understand uh, the other tables, we um, reconsider what actually um, this mass spectrometry based proteomics um, looks like. So we have on the highest level protein groups, and they are split, uh, so the proteins, but actually they are split into peptides. And so when we try to identify the peptides uh, in our mass spectrometer, we try to get evidence. So um, there, are, there are peaks, uh, like three-dimensional peaks. And we want, so sometimes if the peak is good enough, or depending on whether we do DDA or DIA, um, we, then, we then do some kind of second MS. We get the spectrum here. And by that, we try to identify which peptide uh, such a peak here um, corresponds to and by then that we find the peptide and then we find the protein. So every peak here, which uh, we can identify based on the second MS, is some kind of evidence for um, the existence of the peptide uh, in the data set. So the more peaks we can identify with uh, second MS um, and the more 
uh, like point uh, data points per peak we can identify the better um well, the more we can trust uh, that we actually identify the habitat so the more evidence the better obviously so um i already showed you the peptides.txt uh, tables so i will no, not go into this much more um, but what then of course you can do um you have the peptide length so you can see um you can yeah you can plot the length of course and then i mentioned this already in the table that you can count uh, the miscleavage range so um that there was zero miscleavage should be high and that, that there should be like very small miscleavages of course um you can look at the cleavage window. so this was by um this uh, column at the very beginning where everything should be the kor so then as i already mentioned when we looked at the table um there's a start and the end position and this is interesting because then you can plot them against each other and for a protein where you know okay the length of the protein is roughly uh, 1000 amino acids you can then see okay did i cover the full protein or not so you can plot it this way or you can actually plot it against the um, intensity and then you can see okay probably here um i have much more identifications at the or i have like high intensity not much more identification but i have a high intensity at the c terminus so maybe this is like a bit um yeah more in the data set okay so we looked at how this looks like um and now finally looking at the evidence table so uh, i said that here the more evidence the better and evidence is more or less uh, equivalent to peaks where we actually identified peak as belonging to peptide uh, roughly speaking um so it gives us all identified uh, lcms features so all the features where we actually can say okay this belongs to this or that peptide um and this might give us for example some information uh, about uh, the mass error distribution so um, we can see whether there was some kind of systematic error in our experiment so if we plot the retention time against the mass error which is also provided in the table we can see that here okay it's uh, like uh, nicely distributed it's more or less a line and it's like equal to every direction uh, for one experiment but for the other um the mass or error is like totally wobbly um so you might want to check again whether for example there were some temperature fluctuations in the room where your spectrometer and was standing maybe someone went in and left the window open i don't know so if it looks like this um you should check and of course you should do this before the recalibration as explained in the pre-course the recalibration tries to calibrate this that everything that is wobbly like this looks nice like this so of course then to look at this you must do it before the recalibration uh, you can also try to uh, see whether the retention time over different uh, scans stays more or less the same when you plot them against each other so this might also be interesting or you can plot the retention length um, so here probably with column two and three there was something went wrong um, or it's not optimal and then you can also uh, for example count how many um, msms events you needed to identify a feature um, so optimally it should be uh, most of them should be one some of them should be zero because they are identified by match between runs but um, only very few of them should be two or more um, because then this is like uh, telling you that you did not very good uh, align the your retention length okay so this was the identifications part and now we can go into the scans part which typically is a bit more interesting for the people who run the machines and who want to do some kind of quality control so here we get information about um the different run types we can do so like the first ms scan the second ms scan the third ms scan so typically uh, the first and the second um and this is not by default there as far as i know so um you uh, can or cannot check uh, this tick box here if you want to have uh, information about this and then the tables um, about this so what information might this give us so for example when uh, you are on a core facility or something you might be interested to know okay the um, retention time here so uh, you have the retention time here and this is like the, um, intensity 
uh, intensity, which intensity was sufficient to actually still identify something. So um, when you go to the maximum, you say, so there the precursor apex friction is 1.0 because this is the maximum. Then you, um, you can say, okay, relative to this maximum at which threshold was something sufficient to still identify stuff. So maybe here at 0.8 or maybe there at 0.1. And then you can check, okay, did if I did my second MS um, when in the first MS, um, yeah, uh, my mouse is sometimes not working. Yeah, it is, it's, it's fine. Yeah, we'll see. Um, thank you. So um, you can check, okay, um, did I actually identify something if I only, um, did it here or if not, and if, if like in 99% of the cases I did not identify, identify something here, then um, it's not worth doing this, bas this basically. So for, for my precursor selection, I can, uh, by th this kind of information select, okay, um, at which height in my peak does actually um, make a second MS scan sense uh, or not. So you can do this for the retention time. You can do the same for the base peak fraction. So here again, you have like one base peak, which you, know, you like normalize to one, and then you say, okay, um, this is now for uh, data dependent acquisition. Mm, which peaks should I actually select for a second MS scan? So after you, you did some experiments, you can say, okay, if I selected peaks uh, up to 0 0.5 of the highest peak, how many did I, uh, how many identifications did this uh, still make possible? And if it's enough, then nice. If not, then I might go higher with my um, fraction. Or here, I don't know, for example, 0 0.06, did this still lead to some kind of identification or not? And if not, then probably it's not worth doing this. So in the next time I run an experiment, I should change my precursor selection uh, settings. Um, exactly. So um, this indicates like, which you want to select. Um, and finally, again, for the precursor selection, uh, you of course want to look at the isolation window and the precursor ion fra uh, fraction. So um, if you uh, like select something for the second mass scan, it might be, or it's often the case that there's not only your target ion uh, in this window, but also some kind of contaminating ion. And here you can check like what fraction this is, and this is especially important for TNT data. Okay. Um, still, well, what else can you do? Uh, of course, you can check um, whether your uh, fragmentation actually worked or worked not. Work not. So um, the sum of all fragments uh, in the intensity should be more or less the intensity in the first MS scan. So it should be like here, more or less one if you plot them against each other. Um, and it should be not uh, below one. You can also do this against the base peaks. And so there you can do some quality control whether actually your fragmentation was correct or not. And now, uh, finally, and very interestingly, um, you can also check whether your gradient was good for this experiment or not, and whether your cycle time was good. So what's the cycle time? So here you have like, uh, the retention time and you have a peak of intensity in, over the retention time. Um, and what you, what you want to do is that you want to get many samples um, over time. So here we get uh, one, two, three, five, six samples. So this is probably very bad or not enough, not very bad, but uh, probably not enough because this is only very few data um, to base uh, an identification on. So we would like to have more than six data points to do our statistics. Um, so if we reduce our cycle time here, um, then we can get more data points. Or the other way around, we can like flatten this peak and make it a bit slower and a bit wider then. Um, and then of course, with the same distance, we would get um, more data points. So um, when you get information about the uh, average cycle time here, you, you can get information about whether you should or should not optimize your gradients. For example, this here is an experiment where you can, so this is like um, the time of your experiment um, plotted against the cycle time. And you see at the start of the experiment that the cycle time was in, uh, incredibly short, um, but also the, um, 
the number of uh, MSMS scans was uh, very low. So probably at the beginning of your uh, of, of the experiment, there there were only very few peptides actually to um, to uh, identify or not identify, but found by the um, features uh, selection, and then actually um, um, submitted to the second MS scan. So probably um, there were only very few peptides there in the beginning, and then um, they came all in a rush. Uh, after roughly one third of the experiment. And then you can see with more, uh, the more um, MSMS counts, uh, you have the cycle time groups upwards. So what is a cycle time? The cycle time is um, determined by the number of MSMS counts you do, at least in data dependent acquisition, because um, it's the time between two MSMS scans on the same peak. Um, and of course, if you want to um, do MSMS scans on many peaks, then you have to do them one after another. And it takes a long time until you would go back to your first peak. So if you do many scans and many second MS scans, then it takes you long um, to go back to the uh, original one. So the cycle time will be long. And this is exactly what you see here. So the cycle time is long and the MSMS count is long. But the long cycle time is bad or it's not optimal. Um, because then you will get only a few data points for your analysis. Exactly, so probably here, um, this is not optimal, so you might reconsider then um, how to do your gradient because at the beginning, there are only very few peptides and then they come all in a rush. So this is not optimal. Yes, so this were the scans. Now we can go to the features. So as I already mentioned, these are the features which um, were all identified here in the features, uh, which not only which are all identified, they're all identified we had here in the evidence table. And now we have all features. So also the features which um, were not uh, identified. Um, and just as a reminder, what is a feature? I, um, I hope that many people saw the pre-course on YouTube because that actually explained what a feature is. Um, but basically we see from the raw data and uh, here's some kind of uh, isotope pattern, but we have to identify what actually such a peak is. So we do this by different uh, methods of peak detection, and then we get a three-dimensional peak. And this is a feature. So a feature is um, one of these three-dimensional peaks. Um, and if we then uh, give this to the second MS uh, run uh, scan and it identifies it, uh, then it's called evidence because this peak contributes to the identification of the protein or of the peptide. And if not, then we just call it a feature belonging to, uh, not belonging to the evidence. Um, so here we have all features and then of course you can uh, have all the information about the feature. So like where was it found in the uh, Z uh, axis what was its intensity, what might uh, its charge have been, um, at what uh, time in the retention time axis was it, and um, what's the length of the peak, what's the shape of the peak, and so on. So it's uh, pretty straightforward what actually you can tell about the feature. And this might uh, give you interesting information uh, because there you can see, okay, um, in gray, you can plot, for example, um, all the features you have here. And then you can see which ones of them did I actually select for the second MS and which of them again were actually identified as a peptide protein. So of course you want to flatten this uh, gray curve because it tells you that there are many features which you don't know what they are. And of course you want to get this uh, like gray and, and red and green curve like as close uh, equal as possible. So uh, this might also give you some information about uh, your experiment and your uh, and <laughs> what you did there and if you might do it again or not and how good the quality of your data is. Um, exactly. So now we um, already approach the end of this talk in large steps. So we arrived at the metadata section and that's pretty simple actually. You just get a quick summary of what you did. Uh, and of course then all the parameters of max quant and maybe even on your machine. Um, so it's mainly for data quality control. So um, 
you can say how many peptides did I identify in total. So it gives you really information about the whole uh, thing in total. So the whole MaxQuant project. Um, and the, the number of pet, uh, isotope patterns, the rate of identification, uh, and so on and so on. Um, maybe also interesting the absolute mass deviation, because with all this information, uh, you can then try to compare, for example, if you run a facility, different machines, or even different uh, people running the machines, uh, if you want. So you can then um, like do kind of these kind of tables, so you can uh, do some kind of metric based on the scores uh, which you have here in the summary table. And then you can say, okay, which uh, experiment or which instrument performs best or worst uh, and so on. So you can use this uh, for testing a new instrument, for example, or to check um, whether you have like a good average quality of your experiments and so on. Um, now, if you might feel a bit uh, mind blown because these are so many tables, um, it's not necessarily uh, it's not necessary that there are so many tables. So you can um, this is actually an, I think an old screenshot, so there are a bit more ticks now. So um, you can um, select which tables you want or which you don't want. Um, so you can reduce the number of tables um, you want to look at or you actually you want a uh, max quant to produce. And this uh, was this talk. So let's take it together. We have four different uh, groups of uh, output tables. So the identifications table, which is probably the uh, most important uh, class of tables for the biologist. Um, then we have the scans table, which allows you to do many kind of quality controls, same as the metadata. And we have the features where you have information about basically everything that was not identified as some peptide or protein. Uh, 